I'm New Living Translation here. Um, brothers and sisters, I can. That's what Paul said, but he was probably speaking in Greek at the time that he did that in in Rome. But think about this: he had people that were out there that had been converted, that had become Christians, and was following Christ. And so he's addressing them, just like we address you every time we come in here and and speak to you, uh, dear brothers and sisters. Notice he says, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. This is what, is that not what we're praying on Saturday night? Didn't all of Paragol be saved? Did all of Arkansas be saved? Did all of the United States of America be saved? Did everybody be saved? Isn't that, isn't that our heart? Isn't that should be the heartbeat of every Christian. The, the, the first commission, which has never expired, is that we're to go and make disciples of a, a, a every nation. I mean, be, at least be a part of it, and supporting missions is one way that we're a part of people being being uh, discipled in, in all nations. Don't just get them saved, but they you, you get saved, just, you're just a babe, and you just get in the kingdom, and there's a lot of growing to do. And how many knows that we need people to help us grow sometime? That's why God gave us a fivefold ministry to teach us and, and take us into those areas that, that we could uh, really rightly divide the word. And he could guide us and we could guide you. And look at the trust that he puts in the fivefold ministry. Look at the trust he puts in pastors to do our job. Amen. God, does anybody believe God expects us to do our job? Absolutely. We have to do our job. We have to stand strong in the face of all opposition. We have, that's what Jesus did. Verse 2, I know what enthusiasm they have for God. Speaking of Israel, what a Jew had in his perspective at that time. But it is misdirected zeal. Isn't that amazing how he's showing here that uh, you can have misdirected zeal even in the church? You can have your plan instead of God's plan. Hmm? Understand what I'm saying? So it's very vital that we that we are positive, that what the Lord gives us is what we ought to be doing. He said, for they don't understand God's way for making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. Ain't that, isn't that true today? Everybody's got their way. And how many knows there's only one way? Huh? I just love those T-shirts. They, have, they made a camp. I wear mine all the time. I, wouldn't care to have me two or three more, a red one and a blue one. and a <laughs> I like, I get lots of comments on them. Amen. One way, his way. Um, and that's just, that's just the way that, that it really goes. And, but he's, they were trying, and they were still trying it the Moses way. They were trying it, as he shows a little minute. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given, which the law never could do. Uh, the law could never bring us to righteousness, but the law did this. It exposed us to the, to the light that caused us to see the sin. And when we saw the sin, then we died. But it was the law that was holy that gave us the light and the understanding that we needed a Savior. We needed to be saved. And uh, so he said, as a result, I like this, all who believe in him are made right with God. Believe in him, not in the law, but for in him, in Christ Jesus. And he went on, and it, because what he's dealing with here is salvation is absolutely for everyone. The Christian doctrine is meant to go to every person upon this earth that ever was and is being birthed into the world. It's the Lord's will for them to be saved. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. Amen. Uh, there's a lot of these things that uh, if, you, if you looked them all up, you could, that would go to Leviticus 18 and 5. You have to know. Now notice I'm reading, Paul is teaching the Romans, and he did not have the New Testament. He was writing the New Testament. And so his, his references goes all the way through the Old Testament. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, the Old Testament went out. Well, we still need it because it's, it, it, it brings light and gives us, you know, it comes in here and gets a little bit of right this, and we read this, but we don't know the background of it, but it gives us the background and the foundation and telling where we come from and et cetera, et cetera. And so he said, by, but faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go to heaven to bring Christ down to earth, and don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. 
Verse 8, in fact, it says the message is very close at hand. This is how you get saved. This message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your hearts. Hmm? Let me get this off and put it back on again. Maybe that'll quit going. Very close at hand, it is on your lips and in your what? It's in your heart. Amen? It's in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. That's amazing uh, that that is there. Let me read you a, a passage out of Deuteronomy 30, 12 to 14. You don't have to go there. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring, us, bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. I mean, what are we, what, the New Testament literally has taken and redefined the part we really need to know concerning our relationship with the Father God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And he's telling us and explaining to us how the, the Israelites was taught the law and to follow the law and keep the laws and to do the sacrifices and do all I command you, and that he would that he would he would literally postpone their sentence, but they were still going to go to a place and wait till they could be totally redeemed. And they had to wait because nobody was really truly saved until after Jesus died and rose again. It was until he rose again. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so he's, he's going back. He's using the old to instruct the Roman people. Look at the revelation knowledge this man of God had. Hmm? Is, is it any wonder why he wrote uh, what he wrote? I mean, his knowledge of the Old Testament and of the law was very, very, very intact. He knew the law inside, outside, upside down. He was trained and in, 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 uh, taught by some of the greatest philosophers of the day and the time who knew these things, and he was there, and he knew these things. And he said, and that message is the very message about faith that we preach. What do we preach? For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself. That's not even, we didn't have no faith. God give to every person a measure of faith whereby they could be saved. You know what they say? Whereby you could believe. Amen. Because I like what he says. He goes on to say, these two verses are very familiar. We use them all the time and so winning. It, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, confess it with what? And you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, now, anybody believe that? Well, if how can how can I this Jesus that God sent, the Father sent His what? According to John three sixteen, His only begotten Son. Get that? That's two. Okay. And he came, and he suffered, and he bled, and he died, and he didn't go back to heaven and become the Father. But who raised Jesus from the dead? Did Jesus raise himself from the dead, or did the Father God raise him from the dead? And it says that over and over and over, God raised Jesus from the dead. Well, if God's on his throne and he raised his son from the dead, and we know the, the Scriptures teaches us that he set him at his own right hand, that's two. And so that tells me that the name of the Father is not Jesus. I'm not trying to argue people. I won't argue people about the issue, but I just take the Bible for what it says, and that's what it says. Amen? And I'll tell you something else. Jesus is not the Father right now. He, he's the high priest of heaven. And according to the Word, Sister Angela, he's our high priest forever. All oh, Forever. And for everybody, not only for us now in the church, but for all that's going to be in the millennial kingdom. He's going to be the high priest. But he also is coming back in that millennial kingdom as what? 
Come on, folks. King of kings. King of kings. The Lord of all lords. He, the, the, the king, of, I mean, he's coming back. That thousand-year millennial reign that we're going to live after the, the, the days of the tribulation and we come back here and we, the church, are, are to be with him, he's going to be king of kings as, as well. Amen? And, and from, forever, forever, all forgiveness and all sins is cleansed by his blood. Amen? Forever and forever and forever. And you have to understand that people in the millennial kingdom will be taught this. This is what one of our primary jobs will be in the millennium is teaching the Word of God to every creature. Amen. And everybody this birth, and they come up just like, just like the Israelites taught their sons and, and told them about all the history of this. We'll be teaching and preaching the history of, of God making, uh, creating and Adam and Eve and all this stuff and going on down through the time. And, and all the new people being born, you have to understand, we're going to be raised what? Mortal or immortal? Corruptible or incorruptible? And we're going to be teaching people throughout all this time and throughout that thousand years, we're going to be teaching and preaching and discipling people throughout that time. We're not going to be sitting up on a fluffy white cloud playing a harp. Hmm? Down, down by the riverbank just sitting there or fishing and doing nothing and we're just totally retarded and retired. No. Man, it's exciting the future that we have in Christ Jesus. My God's got a wonderful plan. No more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more discouragement, no... no <laughs> and we can quit this foolishness of preaching and get it right for a change. Huh? Amen. But he went on. So he said, verse 10, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. Now, I, I want you to catch this uh, carefully. I'm going to read it. I, want, I need to click a button up here because I want three more translations to, to go with it. For it is by believing in God's heart that you are, come on, made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Now then, look, look at some things that has to be done here. Uh, we have to do what? We have to, we got to believe it where? We got to believe it. God's Word said, by believing you receive God's approval, by declaring your faith, you're saved. So could I believe in my heart but not never confess it and be saved? How powerful is your words? <laughs> I mean, your words are creative. Your words are so awesome. You know, listen, you can't go around confessing your sickness and telling everybody how sick and decrepit and how miserable and how wretched you are all the time and expect to get any better. Every word that comes off of our lips is supposed to be packed full of faith, believing. We only, we should, uh, nothing should come out of our mouth that we do not truly believe in our heart that it is established upon the Word of God. Notice he said in, in the NIV, he said, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. It doesn't say there, for it is with your, uh, with your works that you are believe and you're justified. There is never nowhere in here where it talks about that I am justified by my works. It never says that by my works I'm cleansed. Did you know God doesn't heal you because you're a really good super saint? <laughs> he doesn't. He won't. He don't. You know, we, we try. We, we, we want to just live so clean and so pure and so holy so God will heal us. You're wasting your time if you think that's why you're going to be healed. Can somebody tell me why he heals us? He bore, he bore our stripes. Well, why did he do that for? Because he loves us. The whole planet God's got this huge foundation called, it's not just the foundation, it's the foundation and it totally covers us by his grace. By the grace of God. You know, in John he says that here in his love, not that you've, loved him, but that he first loved you. 
And he first loved us while we were still in our honorary sin. Hmm? And he loves us so much, he's always there to try to pick us up. Remember, you're in the valley. Satan's in the valley. Jesus is right there in that valley, according to David, walking right there for the, I'm not, I'm not scared, for I know you're with me. You know, our little children or grandchildren and stuff, and you get them in a dark room and, and oh, I'm scared, Papa. And you give them a flashlight. Just give them a flashlight. I ain't scared. <laughs> they got the light. Well, folks, we got the light of the world living in us, and what we need to do is turn the light on. Amen? And let it come out of us. And you know, we fight against the do's and the don'ts, but I'm telling you something, you, you, you're, you don't want to sin against him if you're trying to please him. If you really are a believer, true believer, that's, that you know how to confess and believe. Listen, it don't say there that when you do this that you're, you're made perfect. It does teach us that we're made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. We're made by doing what? Believing in our heart first and confessing Jesus is my Lord. Not one time does it say anything there about you confessing your sins. Right? Do you see? Does that say anything about confessing your sin? Now, this is talking about getting saved. This is talking about becoming a kingdom citizen right here. What this is talking about. <coughs> He's teaching them these things. Amplified, really, it's about this long. He said, for, for where the heart a person believes, here's how they define that, adheres to, trusts in, relies on Christ, and so is justified, declared righteous, acceptable to God. And with the mouth he confesses, declares openly and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. Oh, let me tell you how Jesus saved me. You know, I was in darkness. I mean, I, I, I was drunk. I was a drug addict. I was a this or a that. And I, I, I'm still, I, I wasn't worth saving, but he came by. And, and for some, I, I heard somebody give me a word, and that word, that word that I heard, caused something inside of me. For all of a sudden, I'm believing something that I, I never saw before. The lights come on, and I, I accept it, and I believe that God did send His Son. First step, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, I, I can't explain it, but I've been changed. What are you doing? I'm confessing Jesus is Lord. Yeah. The pro there's one huge problem I find with this. Pastor, the biggest problem I find in this whole thing right here, this is too simple. Isn't that what's wrong with, the, with a lot of Christians today? This is too simple. Well, I got to do something. And then, according to this, you didn't have to. Now, we understand that, uh, listen, church, until a person really does it this way, by faith, by faith, accepts the grace of Almighty God to cleanse them and wash them, are they ever going to be able to go to the next level and begin to understand the discipleship program that's coming? They're just babes. I don't care how old they are when they first got born again. Then we start growing. And does God, listen, does, anybody, does God know we're babies? Well, have we received much yet? We need care. We need care. Newborn babes need a lot of care. Anybody, moms, grandpas, dads, babies need a lot of care. I mean, look at them. We, we take them. We've got special seats for them, and we put them in, and they're almost... Uh, uh, protective tank things they put them in and it weighs a ton. You know, you take the baby out and you hardly know that you took the baby out there so heavy. Amen. And we protect them and we care and we, and we got these little bags around it and we got them changes and food and wipes and we got everything. Good now they don't have that over there in the jungle. They still got leaves over there. Huh? And grass. And But think about all this. The care goes into it. Is there any difference in Christians? A baby Christian, they need that kind of care. And you have to, listen, it's one thing to, to know how to understand the newborn babes and what they do and how they, how they form and what their need is. And that's what we've got to do is we've got to look beyond their faults and see their needs because a lot of times their faults that they're committing, they don't know that they're faults. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
They don't know that's wrong. When I met Paulette, you know, I was, I was raised in, in an organization, and the preachers and the deacons and everybody, as a matter of fact, they would walk out the front of the church house door, and they'd fog up. It's wonder they didn't get cancer going in and out. It'd be so thick with smoke. You'd think that the whole church house was on fire. Amen? And that's how I was raised. When I met her, started going to a Pentecost church. God, you thought I brought the devil in when I brought my Marlboros in. And finally, I got smart. I left them in the car. Huh? My goodness. You know, I was told I was going to hell because I smoked. You know what? I was never convinced of that, Pastor. I never believed that. I never, nobody ever, that never got to me. I knew, I knew in my heart where Jesus lived. And also, but the one thing that helped me is they began to show me that I was really a baby. I was Born in this world, a baby. I was never taught anything but one little simple uh, doctrinal issue about being born again. I never grew up. But when I got there, I began to grow. And boy, it's been, I'm still growing. I'm still growing. We, ought to, we should grow. With, he said, with length of days, you should get wisdom. Didn't say you would, but you should. But if we don't apply ourselves, listen, and if you don't take what you have got and apply it, He's not going to trust you with something else. We got to take what we got, what we've got, and so all of us here at New, Co- uh, New Covenant Worship ought to know this one thing: we're at rest when it's concerning our salvation. We're at rest. We're not trying to do something to get saved because we know that we are saved, and we have grown enough to know that if we can, conf- if we do sin, you're taught if you if you. You get away and you start talking to the brother and sister and say, if you do sin, what do we do? We confess our sins. Amen. Amen. And there, that, that's the process too. That, there goes that mouth thing again. If I know in my heart that I've sinned, which is where my conviction comes to, then with my mouth, I confess that sin. And when I confess that sin to the Lord Jesus, now that's where I've confessed the sin itself. Lord, I've been lying or doing this or whatever. Uh, and then I turn around and he says, okay, the high priest's father, blood, been applied. He, he saw the word. He spoke that word. That word washes him clean. So the Bible says that he cleanses me from all unrighteousness, every bit of it, when I confess the sin. It didn't say go in there and confess he's Lord. It says confess your sins. Hey, he put that plural in there because I figured he knew that we was going to generally have. How many knows that one sin generally generates another one and it generates another one? And some people think the only time they can get uh, uh, help from God is at church at an altar. I don't know about you. I can get it 24-7. Any day or night, any time I need to call on God, he is available. Amen. And so we go on to verse number uh, 11. And he says, as the scriptures tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. You believe that? I believe that. Never be disgraced. Will not be ashamed. Uh, Verse 12, Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. Uh, They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. To how many? All that come on. Have you anybody here ever, ever noticed in church? You've been in church for a long time, and when new new people come in, new believers come in, and they accept Christ as their Savior, and, and they go ahead and they, and they get baptized, and and they, they they they're not afraid to do that. And this is why one one thing I like to get people to to confess Jesus when they're being baptized because it's with the mouth that confession's made under salvation. And he turns around and said, and that you will not be ashamed. I believe King James bears that out. Uh, Verse uh, 11 said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's, that's everybody. And for everyone who calls on the, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Everybody. Now that word saved there uh, in the Greek means to be made whole, to be set free, to obtain the victory. In other words, if you're sick, you can call upon the name of the Lord. If you need finances, you can call upon the name of the Lord. Hmm? 
And saying anything, anything that's within in the kingdom. I, well, now we can only get the things that he gave Jesus, because we're only joint heirs with him. So, how much did he give Jesus? <laughs> give him the whole kingdom, didn't he? Everything. I mean, the healing. The if you if you got a poverty mentality, you need to go to another class. You need to go to some financial classes. You need to understand the purpose even of his tithing and offerings and almsgiving laws and find out through them he wants to make you rich. He, wants, he even tells us about working, work with your hands that you'll have to give to another. It didn't say work with your hands so you can hoard it to yourself. We've got stories about people who did that, don't we? Amen? So giving, 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 giving. I mean, how many, and, and hey, honor God. Trust God. I mean, look, you're trusting with your salvation. What? There's no price on that, is there? There's, it's not possible to put a price upon your eternal life. That, there's nothing. I mean, folks, we don't deserve it. Nobody here deserves it, but we have it. Hmm? I never could cleanse me from sin, but the blood of Jesus did. Hmm? And he, he loved me even when I wasn't. A Christian, he loves everybody in this world right now, and you know, and all of this uh, hate crimes that they're uh, accusing the Christian church of, uh, when we speak of about people that are, have these alternative lifestyles and and uh, and stuff. We don't hate them; we love them just like anybody else. I had somebody today. Uh, uh, I was as at a business, and this guy was he was making conversation, and he and he, he brought up his subject about about. Uh, uh, these um, Christians and gays and all the laws, military and all this stuff, and all the government stuff is going on, and and he was talking about how that, uh, uh, you know, he said, I, I tell you, I ask him, them 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 gay groups, them them lesbians and homosexuals. He said, but I'm, I'm telling you, they're just just running this country. He said, man, they they just don't know. And he was really bad. And I said, well, I don't have a problem with them. I said, let me ask you something. I said. Uh, how many adulterers are going to go to heaven? I said, how many fornicators are going to go to heaven? How many constant advent liars are going to go to heaven? And he kind of looked at me and I said, sin is why people go to heaven or go to hell. I said, sin keeps people out. The wages of sin is, is death. And I said, it don't matter which one. I mean, if you're if you're a habitual sinner, I don't care what it is. What you know what sin is? Let me tell you what sin really is. Let me give you a true definition of what sin is. Whatsoever is not of faith. And then what it says? Whatsoever is not of faith is what? Sin. So, gee, that opens up a big can, don't it? Hmm. So do you just about, I mean, do you do everything that you do in faith, believing and receiving? A lot of addiction problems could be done away with if they would view it in the eyes of the Holy Spirit and show that it really don't please God for, for the, a person to do this or that or that over there. And that, guess what? He's not going to throw you out if you're trying. If you really, literally you go to him and tell him, Father God, I know it's your will for me not to do this, but I'm going I'm going." Here's what you're going to do. You're going to get humble and say, Lord, but I'll be honest with you that if you don't help me, I'm weak, and I, I won't be able to do it by myself. I really want to. I really want to. Now, when you say I really want to, you better believe you really want to because in your heart, he's going to know if you're sincere. And if you're not sincere, you don't get no help. I don't know why he won't help me because you're not sincere. You don't really mean it. But if you really mean it, he'll help you. Does that mean he'll do it instantly right then? No. But you need to believe he did. Faith says he did. I don't know what process he'll take you through. I know the process he took me through. <laughs> Amen. How many's had some processes that God took you through? And when you look back, it was simple, but the process was it? Amen. Hmm? Look at the process to get us saved. God had to send his only son. He had to die cruel. He had to be stripped and humiliated and laughed out and counted as a nothing and a nobody. Rejected by his very own people. But he still did it. Amen. 
And he did it for us. And he did it for he did it for all the colors, all the creeds, all the cultures, for everybody, for for all that were made in his likeness and in his image. He did it for them. That's us. Hmm? And what a, what a, we have a good life. We suffer persecution. We, so, we go through trials and tribulations. And everything he's asked us to do has not been, it's not grievous according to the word. And everything that he's asked you to do, if you'll do it from your heart and trust him, it will work. It will work. It will work. Now, we can follow the world. We can say, heck with this. I hate church stuff. I don't want to go to church because they don't want me to do this and they don't want me to do that. Why don't you focus on what we really want you to do, and that's trust in him. Believe, believe on him in your heart and confess him with your mouth. And if you sin, then go before him. Father, in Jesus' name, I confess that... Uh, you know, I hate my mom and my daddy. I just hate them, God. And, and I know that I'm supposed to love them, and I'm asking you to forgive me for not loving them like I should because, you know, the first the prom, uh, commandment to children, the promise to, to them is that if, you'll, if you obey your father and your mother, it will be well with you and you'll live long upon the earth. Hmm? Well, gosh, time. Went by really quick tonight. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of this tonight? I'm going to open my sticky note up and put me a, a thing on here, at least where I'm going to go to the next time, Lord willing. Well, I'm going to kick off verse 14. I don't know.